with me the Foreign Secretary James Cleverly. Uh, what's your response to what Alex is saying, and particularly our effort in getting help there? Well, uh, Alex has, I think, highlighted a number of key challenges and perhaps differences between the situation that we see in Libya and in others in Morocco uh, and in Turkey. Um, in both those other examples, Morocco and Turkey, we had uh, effective governments which had control over the geographical area of the, uh, the tragedies in question. It is a very different situation in, uh, in Libya. Uh, the UK has uh, donated an, uh, an initial uh, million pounds and we have allocated 10 million to be part of a wider international uh, response. Uh, we've deployed an emergency uh, medical team and we will coordinate uh, with uh, other countries. Indeed, when I was in Ankara in Turkey, uh, just at the tail end of last week, I was speaking with the Turkish uh, foreign minister and defence minister about what more we could do uh, as an international uh, coalition to, to support them. Um, but the governance situation in Libya makes it incredibly difficult, which is why... A divided country, essentially. It is a divided country, yeah. and as Alex was was saying, in other places, the international effort can move more quickly. The civil war has, in many ways, broken the infrastructure that you would normally wish to deploy in a terrible, terrible situation like this. Alex, um, just lastly to you, that, is that a picture that you recognise? That, uh, from where you're standing, uh, uh, what advice would you have for the Foreign Secretary? I, I'm, I mean, I'm not sure I'm in a, uh, the right person to give advice to, to James Cleverly, but what I would say is that obviously it's, it's a very complicated political situation and both sides are trying to make capital of this. And certainly the Libyans feel that the British have more of a connection with the West rather than the East. Uh, they definitely don't feel that they're getting enough international support. They haven't specifically mentioned Britain, just it's all the international community. And they're worried that the international community is going to end up dealing with the West, which is the United Nations recognised government. Both governments, both authorities, are, have got a very poor reputation amongst Libyans themselves. They're, they're identified as being corrupt, greedy, uh, self-serving, not really for the Libyan people. And they're worried that whatever aid comes in is going to be snatched by uh, corrupt officials. And so they're very keen for some sort of international overarch on how the, any aid is distributed. The aid is difficult, it, it, it's a difficult country to get access to. It's a difficult country for journalists to get access to. So I imagine it's difficult for the aid officials. But they need help. And there's got to be some sort of way of getting round all this bureaucracy and, and tiptoeing through this minefield of, of politics because the, the actual Libyan people are crying out for it. Alex, thank you very much indeed. Stay safe. Foreign Secretary, um, it's obviously the big a big situation uh, that's occupying a lot of your time. If you don't mind, I, I want to just deal with one other issue mm. from that region. Um, it's a year since the murder of Masa Amini by the Iranian mm. authorities for apparently not wearing her headscarf in what they thought was the proper way. What are we actually doing to support the women of Iran? Well, we have, we have taken direct action uh, in relation to the, to the individuals and institutions that have been involved in oppressing women in Iran. So we have uh, sanctioned the, uh, the, the organisation uh, which is legally persecuting or claiming legal authority to persecute this woman. The so-called morality the police. The morality police. We have sanctioned those. We have sanctioned uh, elements of the judiciary who have clearly been uh, abusing their authority. Uh, the point that I have uh, made, uh, and I've made it in ways that uh, I believe uh, get directly to the ears of the Iranian leadership, is that their actions are being rejected by the Iranian people. Uh, the Iranian people are, uh, you know, sophisticated, well-educated, uh, and in many instances very, very cosmopolitan, are, are saying very, very loudly that they reject the oppressive regime that's coming out of but, Tehran. But, the, but these guys don't necessarily listen, listen even to their own people. They 
might listen to us if we took stronger action. I understand the point about sanctions, but is there more that we ought to do? Because in some sense, it's time running out. You know, thousands of these women have been imprisoned. Uh, we understand hundreds of people have been killed uh, mm. uh, because of the protests. Are we really making a difference? Well, uh, we, have to, we have to understand that with a regime like the one in uh, Tehran, uh, we don't we don't have the traditional international and diplomatic levers that we might have with uh, with other uh, governments. But we make uh, we make it absolutely clear, uh, both directly to the Iranian uh, leadership and uh, more broadly on the international stage, that we completely reject uh, their oppression of uh, of women. Uh, that we will continue to take action okay. to uh, to highlight that and also to uh, apply sanctions to, as I say, both the entities and the individuals who All are right. driving this. All right, Let, let's talk about uh, the issue of when to engage and when not to engage and how you deal with mm. recalcitrant states. You visited China just mm. a couple of weeks ago and days later we find that a researcher working in Parliament who is linked in various ways to senior Conservative MPs, was arrested in March, mm. six months ago, on suspicion of spying for China. Uh, did you know about that arrest before you visited Beijing? Well, uh, as you know, uh, Trevor, we, we don't discuss intelligence matters. We do not discuss No, but it's a simple, a straightforward. It, as a parliamentarian, did you know? As I say, we don't discuss intelligence or security matters, but, but the broad point... But, but the guy was arrested. That's not an intelligence question. Everybody, presumably, would have known about that, including you. Yeah, as I say, we don't discuss... Uh, the, the UK government, uh, by long-standing convention, doesn't discuss intelligence or security matters. The point being that uh, China is a country with which we have to engage. And one of the things that I think it's important people understand is that, is that before, that before you go on, well, that, I, I think viewers would be a bit puzzled that the arrest of somebody by the police, uh, unless you're saying that somehow MI, uh, the, the intelligence services were involved in that arrest, the arrest of somebody by the police for potential criminal activity is an intelligence matter. I mean, everybody in the Metropolitan Police will know about this. It's not an intelligence matter, is it? Well, uh, what you're asking about I'm is... just asking if you knew the guy has been arrested. So the point that, uh, the point that I made is that because of the nature of the arrest, he was the charges on uh, which... Uh, sorry, on, on the suspicions on which he was arrested, of course, there are... Uh, uh, Understandable questions. People are uh, understandably uh, curious about so, 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 what, so, is, so, what is. Sorry to, sorry to press you on it. I'm no, not asking you to comment on on the charges. I'm just simply. No, I'm just simply asking. Before you went to Beijing, did you know that this man had been arrested? And as I said, because of the nature of what he was arrested for, I am not going to discuss what we knew when, uh, because that does drift into that area of of, of work that we do not discuss. Oh, how do you knew or he didn't? <laughs> For the point, I'm not discussing it. <laughs> OK, so you're not going to tell me. All right. All right. Let, let's just deal with the... the uh, something you must know about. Your party's blocked two prospective parliamentary candidates from standing after MI5 warned that they might be spying for China. Um, did you know about that before you went to China? Again, Trevor, you keep asking me about intelligence and security issues, and I'm going to keep giving you the same answer. <laughs> but the point is, the intelligence people would have had to tell people who don't, don't have clearance. And I'm just... I'm yeah. simply asking if you <laughs> knew... You. So I'm a, I'm a government minister, <laughs> and you keep asking me about intelligence and security matters, which you know you're, a, you're, a, All right. you're an experienced politician okay. and an experienced okay. broadcaster, and you know that I can't discuss and I won't discuss those areas. All right. The point is, the, point is the, 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 the fact of the matter is that our engagement with, with, with uh, representative of foreign uh, governments, whether that be in the UK or whether I go to their countries, is, uh, is an important part of what uh, I do and what the British government does. Uh, and it's important, that, uh, it's important that we engage for a whole load of areas uh, to avoid miscalculations and errors, to make sure that messages, particularly the most difficult messages, are communicated straight to the heart of those respective governments. And indeed, when I went to China, 
I absolutely uh, made the point that uh, the, uh, the UK expects China to abide by its international obligations under things like the Vienna Convention uh, yeah. of Diplomatic Relations, uh, that the, uh, the sanctioning of my parliamentary colleagues was completely unacceptable, okay. uh, as well as their behaviour in okay. Hong Kong, in, in Xinjiang uh, uh, and other areas as well. All right. But, um, well, let, let me not ask you the same question, but maybe ask it in a slightly different way. Knowing what you do now, mm -hmm. do you regret that you made this visit at this no. time? No, because there is work to do. There is incredibly important work to do. And the advocates are somehow ignoring China, pretending it doesn't exist, not talking to China, not having an embassy in Beijing and not having a Chinese embassy in the uh, UK. Those, and I know that's not your position, but some people have said that we should disengage from China. That is not okay. a credible option. When there is a difficult relationship, and this is a, 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 a challenging and difficult relationship, it is more important rather than less important that you maintain those face-to-face -face communications. All right, well, look, I mean, let's, let's follow your strategy. Engage, talk to them. Um, when you talk to them about their spying activities, uh, the range of Confucius Institutes, these organisations that they've set up across the world, some here, uh, the suspicions that some of their students are spying on other Chinese students, what, they, what do they say when you say to them, we don't like this, which presumably you must be saying to them. Well, as I say, we, we have made it very, very clear. The Prime Minister did when uh, he met the uh, Deputy President uh, most recently. Uh, I've had the same conversations uh, with my uh, Chinese counterparts that we, we reject uh, any country's interference, including China's, any country's interference in our democracy, okay. Okay. Uh, that we, uh, we expect China to abide by the uh, Vienna Convention obligations that they have freely uh, entered into. Uh, and those are the conversations we have. We have them directly with the people that hold power in the Chinese just, system. Just a very quick question on this uh, as a parliamentarian. Alicia Kearns, chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, she gave this person parliamentary pass. Would it be wise for her to step back from that role? Oh, look, I, I think the idea that a, a government minister uh, passes judgment on the... I'm asking the parliamentarian. The, yeah, but, but you've got to remember the relationship. So um, it is, it, the, the, the right authorities look into this are, is the speaker and the parliamentary authorities okay. about the issuing of, of passes. I know Alicia is a, a, a highly principled and effective individual, and I, I, I think it would be wrong for me, as the minister okay. who she scrutinises, to start... All right. To start All right, let's um, talk about what still remains probably one of the biggest things on your plate right now, which is Ukraine. Mm. Um, nobody's going to doubt the government's sincerity and its support for Ukraine, but um, not a lot of point in sympathy if you're not actually helping. And um, former Prime Minister Boris Johnson had something to say about this uh, in the last few days. He says, what the hell are we waiting for? There's only one thing they want from us, and that's weaponry. Don't understand why we're dragging our feet, why are we so slow? Is Boris Johnson right that we are basically just being too slow while Ukrainians are dying? Well, I don't know when he talks about we who he's talking he's about. He's talking about can't be, us, this country, cannot be, our government. Now, he cannot be talking about the United Kingdom. Because, That's what he says. Because uh, under, under his tenure, um, and I always pay tribute to, to his leadership on this, we supplied the, uh, those end-law anti-tank missile systems that were so instrumental in the defence of Kyiv. Uh, we supplied training. The UK was the first to commit to supply main battle tanks. And then after we committed to that, this during my time as Foreign Secretary under, under uh, Rishi Sunak as Prime Minister, we were the first in the world to commit main battle tanks. Other countries in the world then followed our uh, example. We were the first to commit to the training of uh, fast jet pilots. Then other countries followed our example. We were the first to commit to, okay. uh, to the, no, no, let me finish, because you put a very, very serious uh, point up, and I think it's I important that people understand. We were the first to commit to those long-range uh, missiles that have been instrumental in helping the Ukrainians in their battle in the south and the southeast uh, of, uh, of Ukraine. So we have led the world on all these issues, and when I go to the United Nations tonight, I will continue okay. to advocate for the ongoing international support for Ukraine in its self-defence. I, I understand all of that, but the list you've just given us 
most of it happened under Boris Johnson. No, no, not at all. Well, no, no. Hang on, well, so, no, no, no. Let me finish my question. Main battle tanks. Let me finish was my under question, Rishi if I may. Uh, 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 um, air combat finish. training under Rishi Sunak. Let me finish. Long range missiles okay. under Rishi Sunak. Let me finish my question. Go on. Boris Johnson, acknowledged by the Ukrainians as the first and the most enthusiastic supporter, that's why Zelensky came here first. Surely he should know about the issue of pace since he was the fastest of Western leaders to respond. And he now says that the momentum that he set is essentially being run into the ground by you guys. I mean, honestly, you've got to take this seriously. So, of course, I take his, uh, I take his comments seriously, but I've just given you evidence the fact he is, that he's wrong on this issue because we continue to take the lead on the battle-winning equipments that the Ukrainians have specifically asked for. Uh, fast air, uh, um, so, uh, combat jet aircraft. Sorry, fast air is in-house terminology. That's something different. Combat jet, uh, combat jet aircraft um, uh, and the training of those pilots, the training of uh, Ukrainian Marines the uh, provision of main battle tanks, the provision of depth fires. Uh, if you ask the Ukrainians, and I speak unsurprisingly to the Ukrainians yeah. very regularly okay. on this, yeah. they, remain, uh, uh, they remain incredibly grateful for not I'm just only... our donations, but our leadership uh, on this issue. OK, I'm, I'm stopping you because uh, there are a couple of the other things I need sure, to sure. talk to you about. Um, domestic policies. Uh, there's been a lot of talk this week about the issue about of cuts, cuts of benefits and so on. I don't want to get into that uh, generally, but I want to ask you about a specific thing. Mm -hmm. It's said that the Prime Minister and the Chancellor are considering more cuts to the high-speed rail line to the north, stopping it short of Manchester, um, for example, not letting it come into London. Um, will you be OK with that? Well, look, I, you're asking me what my position would be on speculation about what the government position would be. The fact of the matter is there are, there are spades in the ground. The HS2 is in the process of being built. It is transformational. When I've been up to see the fantastic work that uh, Andy Street is doing uh, in, uh, in, in the West Midlands, much of that is dependent on the economic input that HS2 will have uh, in that region. It's an important piece of infrastructure. Uh, the, uh, the, the Prime Minister is absolutely committed to levelling up. Uh, this is part of that levelling so up. So it needs to go to... It needs to keep going to Manchester? Well, as I say, um, the, uh, you know, uh, foreign affairs is my area of... Uh, yeah, but you're an MP. So, but the, se MP. The, the sequencing, we've always got to make sure that the sequencing is right. What, uh, what, what, what uh, leaders in devolved okay. government want, what investors in the UK want, is uh, predictability, okay. and therefore we will make sure that they right. know exactly what's going last on. Qu last point. Um, sure. I can't really not ask you about the Russell Brand issue. And you can't say anything about specific allegations, but there are a lot of these things coming out of the world of entertainment and politics. One of the by-elections you're going to face this autumn is because of the conduct of an MP. Uh, what is it about your world that makes these things happen? So, look, I don't think it is unique to the, the, the world of, uh, of politics. I mean, sadly, um, we see behaviour like this quite quite widespread. I, I do, however, think there is a particular problem where you have environments where there are very, very sharp differentials in, in, in power. Um, we see that, I mean, uh, we see that in, the, in the, uh, the film industry, the entertainment industry, and sadly, of course, we see it in, in the area that I work in terms of politics, where you have very, very significant power differentials, uh, um, long working hours, people uh, in that environment. Now, uh, that, that is absolutely no excuse for individual misconduct and, and, and people have to take responsibility for their own conduct. But in those environments, I think institutionally, we need to be particularly vigilant. We need to make sure that we are going out of our way to protect the people that have less power than those uh, around okay. them. And we need to respond to their concerns very, very quickly uh, when they are highlighted. Foreign Secretary, thank you very much for your time this morning. Cheers, Trevor.